Coming up uh, from the 14th to the 27th of February is a very special Japanese film festival online free event. And it's my great pleasure to have one of the festival programmers at the Japanese Film Festival talking with me about uh, this event, Manasseh Udomvile. Uh, Manasseh, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Thanks for having me. Tell me about the decisions that were being made about this new free online uh, Japanese film festival. How did it come about? Yep, so JFF Online 2022 has actually been in the works for um, a few months to half a year now, but it basically came about um, after our first iteration of the online Japanese film festival, which we held last year in 2021 because of the pandemic and the fact that we couldn't have a physical festival. But, you know, after the success of that one, um, I guess it was decided that we would be having another one this year because it was so popular. And yeah, it's basically an online event that's held around the world by the Japan Foundation. So not just in Australia, um, JFF Online will be held in 25 countries around the world. And that's terrific that it's uh, being held uh, in so many different countries. That's uh... Yeah, it's quite exciting, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. And just before we talk about the films and so on, how, with this pandemic, of course, um, how is the Japanese film industry responding to uh, uh, this whole situation? Well, yes, so um, last year we had our physical festival as well in cinemas, but even then, um, there's definitely a noticeable difference in the number of films that was made in 2020 to 2021 compared to previous years. So yeah, when just when choosing the films, there was definitely less to choose from because obviously due to the pandemic, a lot of film productions had to either stop production or they had to, you know, kind of delay them a bit. But regardless of that, I think the Japanese film industry was kind of able to make it work. I think it kind of helps that the Japanese film industry is a bit insular as well because they're usually make, making Japanese films intended for Japanese people. So that kind of helps and yeah, it means they're able to still um, produce a number of good films in the year. So yeah, that's how it is right there. Yeah. Over there. Yeah, I'm not surprised to hear that. So thanks for that uh, that overview. Now, there are 17 films that will be screening as part of the uh, Japanese Film Festival online. And it's an interesting mm -hmm. mix of new films, uh, other films that have screened at JFF previously, and some other films. What was the decision making behind uh, selecting the films? Um, yeah, so unlike our, you know, normal festival that we hold in cinemas, this program has both ones, both new releases that have been in cinemas recently and ones from, you know, more previous years. So those, there are more old favourites that have actually been featured in JFFs from, um, yeah, past years. And the decision behind that kind of comes about because obviously it's a bit harder to, you know, get distributors on board with getting their brand new films available online for free um, and available for people to stream all over the world. But we're lucky enough to have, you know, a number of good new releases in there. And yeah, I'm really a fan of the old favorites that are featured in there as well. Um, personally, I think there's a good mix um, of films to cater to everyone. So there's plenty of different genres like drama, comedy, thriller, some documentaries and anime and more and yeah the reason behind that is because with JFF we always try to show a, a side of Japan that viewers aren't really familiar with um, so yeah we try to show people the kinds of films they might not initially go for. Sure no I appreciate that and, and that's the value of a film festival to uh, screen a range of films uh, tell me about the anime. I'm trying to identify it. I, I, I just had a look in cinemas at Bell, which is uh, such oh, a... Oh, you've seen it? Yes. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing that. Yeah, with, with some, a, an interesting storyline about uh, virtual reality and about finding yourself and all that sort of thing. So anyway, Bell is beautiful. So which is the anime in this year's uh, Japanese Film Festival Online? 
So this year, the anime film featured is called Time of Eve, and I think it came out a few years ago. I have to check that. But it's basically set in the future where um, androids exist in modern Japan, and basically um, regular humans and people basically own androids who look like humans and use them to do their whole housework and other chores like that. And they're kind of treated poorly by the humans. So the story is about a high school boy called Rikuo and he has his own android like most people do, but he treats her very coldly. And one day he, you know, is surveilling her actions and where she goes and finds out that she's going to a mysterious location in her off hours. And yeah, when he goes to investigate this mysterious place, he discovers a cafe called Time of Eve. And it's essentially a place or a cafe where both androids and humans go to meet but there's one rule that the cafe has and it's that um, no one's allowed to make distinctions between humans and androids in that space so it's really quite an interesting concept and basically through the whole movie you see basically this boy interacting with all the androids and finding out their backstories and it's kind of related to a tv series that's also called time of eve that you know, delved into the same kind of concept. And it's really quite interesting. I really enjoyed it. Okay, very good, very good. Now, in terms of the newer films, one that struck me is a film called It's a Summer Film. Uh, yes, so It's a Summer Film actually featured in our JFF 2021 festival as well. And it's been quite a popular one that's been featured in film festivals around the world. And it's about a high schooler called Hadashi and She's absolutely obsessed with samurai films. Like she has all these posters of the old samurai stars um, in her space. And she basically decides to create her own um, samurai film, which is inspired by the genre. So she kind of grabs her best friend and these random kids from her school and they come together to make their own DIY samurai film. And yeah, it's a really fun film, really funny, and I think it's one that everyone will enjoy as well. Okay, very good. And uh, again, with some of the newer films, if we look at, at Masked Ward, which sounds like quite a thriller. Yes, that one's a thriller, and it's another new release that was um, featured in our festival last year. And it's basically starring Kentaro Sakaguchi, who is a big star in Japan. And he stars as a substitute doctor who is working at a former psychiatric hospital, which has a shady past. But anyway, one day he's on shift and he finds himself confronting a criminal who's wearing a clown mask who demands that he treats an injured um, university student. But when, you know, when that's all solved, um, the two realise that there's more to the place than meets the eye and... In addition to that, the hospital staff are really be being really suspicious and they won't do things like call the police. And yeah, um, it's based on a medical novel by a real life doctor. And yeah, you soon find out that, you know, this clown has deeper intentions that you first realise. Okay, very good. Now, Ito sounds like a film that wasn't uh, at JFF previously. Yes, that one wasn't um, at our past festival, but it's also a new release and it revolves around, you know, um, the main character, which the film is named after, and it's a coming of age story. So Ito is an introverted high school student who lives in Aomori Prefecture, who, which is in rural Japan, and she's really shy, really introverted and has barely any friends, mainly because she has a very strong um, rural Japan accent. But yeah, she is a talented shamisen player, which is a Japanese classical instrument, but she's hardly played since her mother's death, um, which you know sort of has a big impact on her. But one day she spontaneously applies to work in a maid cafe and gets the job unexpectedly. So by working there, she kind of grows out of a shell and you know, finds a second family in her employees and kind of, you know, finds herself along the way. Yeah, that's what that's about. And it's a really um, lovely film. I recommend that one as well. Sure, sure. Sounds really nice. And as a contrast, uh, another film that played at JFF last year, Mio's Cookbook. 
Oh yes, that one was a really popular um, film at the festival last year. So we're glad to be featuring it. It's about, well, it's a period drama about um, two best friends called Mio and Oe who grow up together in Osaka um, in the 1800s. But after a flood, the two are separated and can't find each other again. So um, one of the girls, Mio, it becomes an orphan and she stays with a kind restaurant owner. And essentially the story is about her um, taking her cooking skills from Osaka to Edo, which is now Tokyo in Japan. And it's about her kind of improving her cooking and working her way to the top with her skills. And yeah, it's quite, um, you know, heartwarming to see basically, um, to see her improve her skills and kind of see the impact that her food has on the people around her. Okay, okay. Um, I remember last year uh, there was a, a really interesting documentary about sumo wrestlers, Sumodo, the successors of Samurai, and uh, I'm pleased to see you've programmed it uh, for the online festival. Yeah, I'm really happy to be featuring that one as well because I really personally enjoyed it, um, despite not you know knowing anything about sumo or sumo prior to it. So um, if people don't know, it's basically, and sumo is basically a documentary about sumo wrestlers in Japan, and it just gives a really in-depth and eye-opening look into what it means and what it's like to be a sumo wrestler in modern day Japan. So yeah, over the course of the documentary, you um, follow the lives of two famous um, sumo wrestlers, um, Goedo and Ryuden, and it's basically following them as they prepare to um, you know, um, battle it out in the new year, which is basically the biggest battle of the year for sumo wrestlers. And you see everything from their training to what they eat and how they prepare for their matches. Yes, yes, really interesting. And the, and the other documentary you've got is uh, a slightly older one, uh, but uh, sounds interesting, The God of Ramen. Yeah, so that one is one that, you know, I think food lovers would really enjoy. And it's about the life of a man called Kazuo Yamagishi. And he founded um, Daishokuin, which is a legendary ramen shop that used to be in Tokyo um, back in the day, since this documentary is quite old. But um, it documents his life and basically his massive influence that he had on the ramen industry and the people around him. So this was before the age of social media and everything. But despite that, his ramen shop was incredibly famous and then he, the crowds that he drew with his ramen sometimes extended into hours. And he also had plenty of apprentices over the years. So the documentary is also about his kindness and how he um, you know, imparted his knowledge to others over the years. Okay, very good. Now back to some of the newer films, uh, two I, I'm not familiar with, one called Aristocrats and another called Awake. Oh yes, so Aristocrats is a drama and that was also a um, newly released film like you mentioned and um, it's basically about two women who live in Tokyo but despite that they have completely different upbringings and live in different worlds within the same city so one of them is uh, a girl a woman called Hanako who had a very sheltered upbringing and is you could say that she's quite well off and she's desperate to settle down and get married throughout the film and that's kind of influenced by her, you know, up, upbringing. And the other woman is called Miki, and she has moved from the countryside to Tokyo to attend a prestigious university. But because of the circumstances, she needs to drop out and, you know, starts working straight away. But anyway, yeah, it's about the story of these two very different women and how their paths cross within the city of Tokyo. So it's very... It's a very emotional drama and I think it tells a side of Tokyo that um, most people might not be aware of. So yeah, that one's a, quite a good film. Okay. Um, yeah. The other one that you mentioned, it was called Awake. Yeah. And this one was based on a true story. So um, it's about um, a, well, a boy called Eiichi who has, you know, grown up um, basically playing shogi, which is kind of like Japanese chess. But, you know, as he grows up, um, 
he can't beat his rival and he ends up giving up his dream of becoming a professional shogi player. Instead, um, he starts going to university and finds himself developing a shogi game software, which ends up becoming really successful and becomes quite famous. And because of that, he um, comes face to face with his rival again um, after many years. And his rival Riku has ended up becoming a very famous, famous shogi player. And yeah, in basically the whole story is about how they come back together again and uh, are versing each other again in shogi, but in very different, in a very different format. So that's quite interesting, and even more interesting that it's inspired by a true story. Okay, very good, very good. I always like uh, historical dramas, and I notice uh, you're playing one that uh, dates back a few years one called The Floating Castle. Yes, so that's another one of our period dramas that we're filming and it's based in the 1500s and it's about the story of a powerful daimyo called Toyotomi Hideyoshi and he has a plan to unify all of Japan and sets out to do that. But in the process, he comes across a floating fortress and yeah, basically to carry out his plan of unifying Japan, he has to you know, take on this army and yeah, that's what the whole film is about. And there's plenty of action in this one, but also comedic elements as well. Okay. And, and here's one that really intrigues me. I, I'm not familiar with it at all. The Chef of South Polar. Oh yeah, this one is, it's quite old as well, but I think it really holds up because it's quite, you know, it's quite funny and charming as well, but Apparently this one was based on an autobiography as well, but it's about a chef who previously worked in the Navy and he is unexpectedly deployed to Antarctica to work at a research station for a year. So he didn't choose this and it's kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> if you were referring to that situation, it wouldn't be the most ideal thing. But it, the film is about how he tries to make the best of it. And yeah, um, it's kind of a slice of life. So you see how this chef and the seven other men in the team kind of deal with daily life in Antarctica. And it's pretty funny to see because over the course of year, the year, you kind of see how they gradually start to go a little bit crazy from being away from their family for so long and being cooped up in this research station together. And yeah, the main thing that they have to look forward to in this place is the meals that the chef is serving up every day. So this is quite a funny film in my opinion. And it's also one that's quite heartwarming. And I think it's one that a lot of people will enjoy. Okay, yes, I'm sure many of the films will be uh, enjoyed. Now, speaking of Antarctica, to some extent, I noticed a film, I don't know if it has any Australian connection, but uh, it's called Ozland. Oh, yes, yeah, so it's actually not related to Australia at all, and the Ozland in the title is kind of a reference to The Wizard of Oz, which is a theme that comes up in the movie a lot. And it's about the story of a woman who, you know, takes on the job and is, well, she thinks she's hired by her dream company, but instead she's um, taken from Tokyo to um, Fukuoka, which is across the country in Japan. And she ends up working at an amusement park, which is, you know, not exactly what she expected from her dream job. And, yeah, you see in the beginning that she kind of resists the idea of having to work in this place and having to do things like taking out the rubbish and stuff. But over the course of the film, she kind of opens up her heart to, you know, this kind of job and the fact that it makes a lot of people happy. And she also becomes a lot closer to her fellow colleagues. So, yeah, that one's quite um, an entertaining film. And it's also one with a lot of comedy and a lot of funny moments in it. Okay. Now, I've mentioned quite a few of the films, but uh, Manasse, are there any other films you would like to mention as highlights for you as part of JFF Online? Oh, yes. Yeah. So um, one of the films that's featured that I personally, you know, count as one of my favourites is called Her Love Boils Bathwater. And this one's a drama that came out quite a few years ago as well. But I really enjoyed it. It's about um, a single mother called Futaba who, you know, she finds out that she is 
basically dying from late stage cancer. And yeah, um, after finding that out, she essentially decides to um, revive her family's um, unused bathhouse in the process. And after that, she also um, decides to tie up all the loose lens ends in her life. And in the process, she, um, in a way, brings back her whole family together because, you know, despite sing being a single mother, um, her husband actually left her the year before that. So it's kind of about how she brings him back and she brings